Dr. Louis J. Patsavos, Ph.D. The Canonical Tradition of the Orthodox Church. The Theological Basis for churches, the, the Church's Law. Canon Law. Although generally referred to as canon law, such a name given to the Church's law suggests a parallel to secular law. It would be more correct to call it the tradition of the Holy Canon, since they are the object of its concern. This law of the Church, her canonical tradition, is an outgrowth of the Holy Canons, and it appears on the surface to have much in common with secular law, involving persons invested with authority, bishops, as well as the means of creating, formulating, interpreting, executing, validating, amending, and revoking laws, through synods or conciliar actions. Church and Secular Law The apparent similarity of the Church's law to secular law led some to contest the integrity of the former. Yet without it, it is clear, there would be many varied problems besetting the Church. In the last analysis, the Church's law exists to safeguard particular interests from the arbitrary intervention of superior interests. It should not be understood as subjecting a person to subservience, but as guaranteeing his freedom. Contrary to what some have believed, the Church's law differs essentially from secular law. Its difference lies mainly in the premise that the original source of canon law is found in the will of God to establish his church on earth. Consequently, the source of its authority stems from the will of God. Furthermore, the church's law differs from secular law in purpose, humanity's salvation, time, extending beyond this life into the next life, scope, including one's own conscience, and place, the universal church. The main goal of canon law. When our Lord entrusted the work of salvation to the Church, which is a society of mortal men and women, he obliged her to provide herself with the necessary means of survival. This was to assist her in organizing herself, in overseeing the orthodoxy of her members, and in guarding against factions. In short, he obliged her to provide herself with a set of rules to live by. In doing so, the, in so doing, the Church, as, as a community of faith, came to be associated with juridical organization. This does not mean, however, that the community of faith was thereby reduced to a legal institution. The distinction is an important one. Our Lord himself, that historical background, our Lord himself instituted some elements of such an order. He preached the gospel of salvation to his contemporaries, but did not leave to their arbitrary will the task of spreading his message for the benefit of future generations. He assigned that task to a chosen, a, a group of men chosen with divine care and wisdom, the apostles, who were clearly aware of the sacred mission with which they were entrusted by the Master. Following his ascension, he endowed them with the authority to make the decisions necessary to assure the continuation of the work he had already begun. Decisions such as the election of Matthias to take the place of Judas among the apostles and set, setting the conditions for entry into the church were made at the outset. In fact, they constitute the beginnings of the church's law, in the development of which St. Paul played a predominant role. With the spread of the Christian community throughout the entire area of the Mediterranean, the initial organization of the church soon had to be extended. During this stage of growth, a hierarchy was developed and new conditions of life modeled after the teachings of Christ came into existence. It thus became necessary to define the status of the believer within the Christian community and society at large. This organization was only rudimentary, but it clearly was there. It is quite evident that the Church in her primitive period had no precisely defined juridical organization, much less a technique or science of law. However, all the elements of a dr true juridical organization were there. Those persons invested with authority made rules and demanded strict adher adherence to them. Synods came out unsparingly against those who threatened the unity of the Church and the purity of her doctrine. They did not hesitate, furthermore, to impose severe sanctions upon those who opposed her discipline. It was the first ecumenical synod of Nicaea, 325, which referred to canons as the disciplinary measures of the church. The distinction, therefore, between canones, the disciplinary measures and rules adopted by the church, and nomoi, the legislative actions taken by the state, came about quite early. Canon Law in Christian Society the law which emerged from the earliest times developed in response to the needs of the ecclesiastical community. During both good and bad periods the church's history, of the church's history, her law has adapted itself constantly to the circumstances of the time, up to the present day. 
the collections of laws which the church has promulgated in no way detract from her exalted status and sacred character. They reflect a certain imperfection, however. However, this imperfection lies not at the institution of the church, but in those individuals whom it is com of whom it is composed. As an institution of divine origin composed of human beings, the church is at the same time both a human and divine institution. It might be said that it is at a crossroads of the finite and the infinite, the created and the uncreated, the human and the divine. Our Lord entrusted the work of salvation to his church, that is, to human beings. Because of this, he gave the church roots in history and subjected her to temporal contingencies. It is in the church and through the church that human beings must in principle attain their salvation. When we speak of the church, we speak of a society. As such, she is governed by rules which determine her organization and her relations to her members and those outside her fold. Finally, it must not be forgotten that the church is not to be identified with her rules. The church indeed has rules, but she has much else besides. She has within her treasures of another order and another value besides her canons. She has her theology, her spirituality, her mysticism, her liturgy, her morality. And it is most important not to confuse the gospel and the pedalion, the connection, the collection of canons, theology and legislation, morality and Jewish puneys. Each is on a different level, and to identify them completely would be to fall into a kind of heresy. The canons are at the service of the church. Their function is to guide her members on the way to salvation and make the following that way easier. The church's legislation is only one aspect of her life, and above all does not represent her essence. The church is the mystical body of Christ. However, her presence in history necessarily has brought forth a juridical system and juridical institutions. Law indeed has its purpose in the church and is, and is justifiable, but it must also be recognized that this law is of a special character. The uniqueness of canon law, which sets it apart from secular law, is due to the special character of the church it serves. Because it shares to some extent in the exalted mission of the church, it differs from all other systems of law. I don't know if he's writing this for a popular audience or what, but it seems much less uh, nuanced than the previous one, which talked about the uh, the unchangeability of the, of the canons. Um, this one um coming to a similar conclusion but from a different direction and i i still in using a different a different language so in in the like both but both this one and um bartholomew uh, uh, or patriarch bartholomew wrote a piece in the 1974 that we had to read for class as well but i can't find in an open source format um talks about the, the, the canons being able to be mistaken. Whereas it, see, it seems as if this one, the canons of the church, changeable or unchangeable, does not make that claim. Instead, what it says is that in different times and places, different canons come, fall, either are, are used or fall into disuse based on whether or not the conditions necessary for its application are present in the people. In other words, uh, at this stage of a person's development, uh, is this anthrop it is human anthropology is the particular thing that this is addressing um, actually being manifested in this time and place. If not, then that canon falls into disuse. But if so, then the conditions are there for its use again, um, and so, the, but the 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 and so I can see how here in his conclusion about creativity, one can make the argument that you could say yes, it is a creative process to try and find find the ways in which our current time has resonances with past times, and also has um, uh, points of departure from past times, and to apply in the same manner, in the same spirit in which canons were passed in the past, um, new canons that specifically make reference to the fast changes that have taken place to, to our life in the modern world, uh, without in any way writing over or simplifying or uh, distilling the canons, because a distillation process always includes an element of interpretation that um, that has a particular bias associated with it. So just leaving the canons as they are makes more sense to me, frankly, than this whole process of 
of, uh, of trying to simplify what's already come. Now you can write new canons in response to things, and you can prioritize the new over the old or integrate the old into the new. Um, but to begin rewriting or writing over past canons, uh, it tells me that you're more interested in undoing what was before and stamping your own image on what is to come rather than acknowledging that these have a role if these circumstances ever arrive again. Um, that, that didn't sound to me like what Patriarch Bartholomew was saying in his, uh, his paper. He was saying, no, we need to make changes, especially in how the Orthodox Church relates to other religions and uh, to uh, other uh, Christian traditions. Um, if he just said other Christian traditions, maybe I would have given him a pass, but he meant, specifically mentions other religions, which is, uh, I don't know what to say. <sighs> I don't know what to say about that. The composition of the church's law. The essence of canon law. Given the above justification for the existence of the church's law, it now remains to define what in fact it is and of what it is composed. The church's law, commonly referred to as canon law, is the system of law emanating from the holy canons, which derive from the church on her own authority. The church, as has already been stated, is at the same time both a human and divine institution, so incarnational. As an institution uh, with a human element, the church has needs of laws to govern her organization, her relations to her members, to those outside of her fold, to the state, and to other religions, religious and secular bodies. Nevertheless, the church's law is first and foremost spiritual, since its main purpose is the spiritual growth of the faithful. Furthermore, its main object of concern is the inner disposition and the intention behind one's actions. So it doesn't, doesn't have to do with the transformation of the whole person. Like, I mean, the human being accords with certain laws, and if it doesn't fun and if it ceases to function in that very, very specific, minute fashion, then the human being's body falls apart. Like if one thing in the you know the blood is is malfunctioning in the cascade that leads to coagulation of the blood, then you die if you start bleeding. So it's it's if in if the church truly is organic, that actually makes its laws all the more important. And you can identify whether it's doing well by what's happening to its members. Yes, spiritually, in terms of vitality. I mean, it's like, yeah, so um, a person may never run a marathon in their whole life, may never run, uh, may never ex exercise athletic capabilities. And thus, the, the various canons for action for that human being that would apply to athletics do not apply to that person in that case. But if that person were to undertake sport, or running or anything there are certain rules that would apply those are canons collections of canon law the holy canons which are the basis of the church's canonical tradition stem from three main sources ecumenical synods representing the universal church local synods subsequently ratified by the ecumenical synods is representing the tradition of the universal church and the fathers of the church all of these canons which number about 1000 are contained in several collections the most widely and you the most widely used today in the Greek speaking Orthodox churches is the pedalion or the rudder, which takes its name from the metaphor of the church depicted as a ship, as the ship which is guided safely to its destination by means of a rudder. In like manner are the whole other members of the church guided by their voyage through life by means of the holy canons. Like can the canon law of the Roman Catholic Church, the canon law of Orthodox Church has not been codified. Neither it is is it prescriptive in character anticipating a situation before it actually takes place. Instead, it is corrective in nature, responding to a situation when is, once it has occurred. Because of the absence of a universal codification binding upon it, all autocephalous, autocephalous or self-governing Orthodox churches, great importance is attached to the local legislation of these, church, of these churches. Canon 39 of the Quinisext Synod, or the Synod of Trullo, held in 691, recognized the right of a local church to have its own special laws or regulations. For our God-bearing fathers also declared that the customs of each church should be preserved. 
Such laws or regulations, however, must be, always be reflect the spirit of the church's universal law as found in the holy canons. Um, so that becomes the basis of economia, the particular application of the holy canons in different uh, different circumstances. That gets expanded in the 1923 council, uh, uh, you can call it not synod, uh, congress. The canonical tradition. The overriding consideration in the acceptance of a local church's custom is, as law is the spiritual well-being of the members of Christ's mystical body. What is of importance is how people in any age or place may best serve and worship God. It is obvious that what is well-intentioned for the church as a whole may not be well so, so well-suited to some particular local conditions. Similar, what is good for one age or place may, may under different conditions, constitute a hindrance. Thus, it is... It is that the church's canonical tradition has such regard for local custom. Having evolved within the context of local conditions, it best expresses the mind of the local church on how the cause of God may be served in her special conditions. Custom is the continuously expressed will of God's people. The significance of this statement becomes apparent when one realizes that the last ecumenical synod with universally binding legis legislation occurred 12 centuries ago, 878 AD. Consequently, the emergence and growth of local custom, especially since that time, is what in large measure, measure has sustained the Orthodox Church throughout the ages. The growth and development of a local custom that acquires the force of law is what gives to the Church's canonical tradition its great flexibility. Local laws or regulations are the means by which the Church's universal canonical tradition adapts itself to changing circumstances. Although this is true, it must not be supposed that any local custom automatically establishes itself as part of the church's canonical tradition. For that, for that, for that, certain conditions must be met. In the first place, it must be the conviction of the ecclesiastical community concerning a certain act repeated in the same way for a long time. Therefore, two main conditions are necessary for the acceptance of a custom as law. It must have enjoyed a long and steady practice, and the consensus of opinion must be that it has the force of law. In order for custom to be accepted as a, as a source of the Church's canonical tradition, it must be in full harmony with the holy tradition in Scripture, as well as doctrine. One example of local legislation is the current charter of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. According to Article 1 of the Charter, the Archdiocese is a province within the territory the territorial jurisdiction of the Most Holy Apostolic Ecumenical Patriarchal Throne of Constantinople, governed by the Holy Canons, the present charter, and the regulations promulgated by it, and as to canonical and ecclesiastical matters not provided therein by the decisions thereon, the Holy Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. As a province of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, the first ranking see among the autocephalous Orthodox churches, the American Archdiocese is an ecclesiastical body deriving its authority from a central source. Various components comprising its canonical structure are elements included in the legal system of every Orthodox Church, every local Orthodox Church. Codification of Canaan Law Because of the apparent dissimilarity among the legal systems of the various autocephalous churches, there are those who consider a uniform codification of the Church's law a near impossibility, and that a separate codification for each of them will be necessary. Then there are those who reject the codification outright, as conflicting with the spiritual essence of Orthodoxy. They believe that the deep unity which exists among all the Orthodox churches in faith and sacramental life can continue to be maintained according to the local traditions of each autocephalous church. Nevertheless, both views mentioned above have been challenged by a former Metropolitan, now Patriarch Bartholomew of Philadelphia, in his article entitled A Common Code for the Orthodox Churches. He reminds those who stress the dissimilarity among the legal systems of the autocephalous churches that within Orthodoxy there is basically a single law whose most important sources are common to the, all the Orthodox churches. Furthermore, the Orthodox church is neither the sum of a number of independent churches nor a federation of churches within external interchurch law, but one church, the body of Christ, within the, which local churches are expressions of the one undivided living holy Catholic church in various places. I don't see why that necessarily, you know, having just read that, I don't see why that necessarily contradicts uh, the idea that um, in different, actually it fits right in with what they've been saying about the uh, the difference in how canons are applied in different circumstances throughout time and whether canons are used or fall into disuse. If they're used and fall into disuse um, in different uh, circumstances, uh, because 
different circumstances have arisen due to different political systems, etc., in various jurisdictions, then would it not be the case then that um, the particular expression of the rule of life of orthodoxy would be different in differing countries? Mostly the same, but with different, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm struggling to understand what the, uh, what he means by this. On the other hand, those who reject codification on the grounds that it conflicts with the essence of orthodoxy are reminded that the church is not only a charismatic body, she is an institution with both a divine and human element. And as such, she is in need of a code of laws to, en to enhance the evolution, the evolution of ecclesiastical life, and to assure further development of orthodox canon law. Oof. I don't like this. I just don't. I don't like this. Um, what's wrong with ecclesiastical life as it is? The healthy debate and argumentation among different jurisdictions uh, is a good thing. And the redundancies are a good thing. You know, edit out the redundancies in the scriptures. Things that matter more are repeated more. And they stack on one, on top of one another, like an archaeological dig. Why do you need to edit things out? Once you begin the process of editing things out, uh, there's an... There's an active element of interpretive strategy that takes place and actually it leads to a narrowing actually a constraining of the tradition a lessening of the freedom within constraints limitations free but limitations free when those limitations are free of politically motivated meddling bishops Characteristics of the Church's Law. Applicability of Canon Law. Any discussion of the characteristics of the Church's Law must be necessary, must necessarily address the question of the applicability of the Holy Canons to today's realities. Viewpoints expressed on this vital issue range from one extreme to another and are mutually exclusive. On the one hand, there are those who revere the letter of the Canons. But as has already been remarked, no one seems to absolutize all of them. John Meyendorf, Contemporary Problems of Orthodox Canon Law. The Greek Orthodox Theological Review, 1972. Then there are those who deny the relevancy of the entire body of canons in its present state. Obviously, both views leave little room for conciliatory approach and rather tend to polarize. In order to reflect in a, a rapprochement between the widely divergent views just mentioned, the question must first be asked, how were the holy canons meant to be understood? Nicholas Afan Af Afanasiev, in his article entitled The Canons of the Church Changeable or Unchangeable, Authors a formula which might be acceptable to all factions. Canons are a kind of canonical interpretation of the dogmas for a particular moment of the Church's historical existence. They express the truth about the order of Church life, but rather than expressing this truth in absolute forms, they conform to a historical existence. Such a formula recognizes the absolute validity of all the canons as practical aids, which give expression to doctrinal truths at some point in history. Some of these aids, however, it sees as having outlived the purpose for which they were originally intended i.e. they are conditioned by time. Hmm. No, they're, con they're conditioned by expression of the human, which is the church, at a moment in time. But that time can come around again. And if you edit it out, you, gotta, you, get, you get the opportunity of doing whatever you want. Consequently, they cannot give expression to doctrine without causing distortion, simply because they were intended for another era. This, of course, cannot be said of all the canons, since there are many which express doctrine as clearly today as when they were first adopted by the church. See, the problem with this is that you begin the process of picking and choosing which ones apply and which ones don't. And who's doing this process? Who's choosing? What are they motivated by? since there are many which express doctrine as clearly today as when they were first adopted by the church. Therefore, while some canons continue to reflect doctrine and practice, others do not and must be seen in a historical context in order to be understood. 
The following example will illustrate the point. It is a doctrine of the Church that the ecclesiastical hierarchy is an institution ordained by God. There are canons which express this doctrine, but in conformity with the era in which they were adopted. Canon 5 of the Holy Apostles forbids a bishop, presbyter, or deacon to put away his wife under the pretext of religion. A later decision in the Sixth Ecumenical Synod introduced celibacy for the episcopate and directed that all previously ordained bishops should leave their wives. This synod was correct when it said that it was publishing the new decree not with any intention of setting aside or overthrowing any legislation laid down by the apostles, but having due regard for the salvation and safety of the people for, and for their advancement. I feel like this example has been used multiple times by um, as as the precedent, and it's because it's the earliest one of a of a seeming flip flop. The Apostolic Canon expressed a doctrine concerning the ecclesiastic hierarchy, but in conformity with its era. When the historical conditions of life changed, so too did the manner in which this doctrine was expressed. One might say, actually, in fact, that uh, yes, I, I think I think if you actually look at the context of this time in history, you'll find that. Um, Well, I'm not sure exactly what you'll find, but I think from the other source that we were reading, it was in part due to um, increased standards of uh, of holiness from the apostolic era, or a differing standard of holiness, different expectations of the people, etc., and different views towards uh, sex and sexuality, probably. This has a huge question mark beside it for me. Pastoral significance of canon law. The canons ought also to be understood as pastoral guidelines. As such, they should serve as models upon which subsequent ecclesiastical legislation is based whenever possible. The canons of the fathers in particular reflect the pastoral nature of their contents. The fathers who write, wrote them did not think that they were writing legislative texts. In most cases, they were either responding to the questions put to them by individuals seeking their counsel, or else expressing their views on matters of gravest concern to the church. Because of their pastoral sensitivity and the high esteem in which they were held, these fathers greatly influenced both their contemporaries and succeeding generations. As a result, the directives contained in the canons of the fathers prior to the Sixth Ecumenical Synod were recognized by the Second Canon of that Synod as equal in authority to the synodical canons themselves. In fact, several of the canons of St. Basil, repeated among the canons of the same six ecumenical synod, were recognized by the second canon of that synod as equal in authority to the synodical canons themselves. The fathers whose canons appear in our canonical collections exerted no less an influence upon the development and formation of the canons of their synods. Consequently, the pastoral nature evident in the canons of the fathers is also easily discernible in the canons of the synods. It is because of this characteristic that the canons have been referred to as fruits of the Spirit, though, whose purpose is to assist mankind in its quest for salvation. Certainly such a lofty purpose can only be appreciated when the canons are understood as pastoral guidelines and not as legislative texts. Viewed simply as legislative texts, the canons differ little from laws to be upheld rigidly and absolutely. Recognized, however, as the pastoral guidelines, which in fact they are, the canons serve the purpose for which they were intended with compassion and flexibility. The, it is this latter understanding of the canons which makes comprehensible the exercise of economy as practiced, practiced within the Orthodox Church today. Okay. So, this is, this is the origin of the concept of economy as it's been used in the Orthodox Church today. Um, and so, it's the... Uh, which, which does make sense. Makes sense that, you know, in the life of all of us, God meets us where we are. God meets us where we are when we're babies, when we're children, when we're adolescents, when we're adults, when we're elderly. And that applies both physically and spiritually and intellectually. He meets us where we are. And so the same thing can be true in the church, where God meets us where we are at every stage of our development. But the problem with messing with the canons is you're actually erasing the witness of how God has met the people of God, where they are throughout history. There's plenty of repetition. And it, it, it forces you to take an ahistorical approach to um, how God is calling you to interact with our current situation. 
which everybody in modernity makes a big deal about how it's unprecedented and we need these wide scale changes because of this, that, and the other thing. When really, I mean, if anything, we should have we should have more canons about um, helping me, people to navigate technology. The appalling situation we're in morally in relation to these technolo technological devices that we use that are basically Pandora's boxes of vice. A false connection. So I, 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 um, I have a hard time seeing the project that these guys want to employ uh, being something that actually um, brings a greater depth of spiritual vitality to the church. The concept of economy. Unlike secular law or mosaic law, the purpose of the church's law is the spiritual perfection of its members. Mere application of the letter of the law is replaced by a sense of the spirit for the spirit of the law, the adherence to its principles. The purpose is the determining factor when authority is granted to apply the law when with when circumstances warrant according when circumstances warrant according to each individual case. The spirit of love, understood as the commitment to the spiritual perfection of the individual, must always prevail in the application of the law. The abolition of the letter of law by the spirit of the law has led to the institution of economy, exercised in non-essential matters. Through economy, which is always an exception to the general rule, the legal consequences following the violation of the law are lifted. Economy is granted by the competent ecclesiastical authority and has not so much the character of urgency as it does the character of compassion for human frailty. The character of compassion is justified by the church's ardent desire to prevent any adverse effects from the strict observance of the law in exceptional circumstances. The premise upon which the exception is granted is the general welfare of all concerned. This premise exists in all systems of law, but it finds its fullest expression in the church's law. As the law of grace, it is characterized primarily by the spiritual attributes of compassion, pastoral sensitivity, and forgiveness. Economy is not something to be applied at random or arbitrarily. It is governed by defined guidelines which must be strictly adhered to by the competent ecclesiastical authority granting it. First and foremost, exception from a law which has been endowed with universal recognition and validity is not possible. It is only from a law that has not been endowed with such authority that a person can be released if it is deemed spiritually beneficial. The right to exercise economy is the sole prerogative of the legislator, council, or holy synod of bishops. This right can be in turn delegated to individual bishops by corporate authority of the synod. This delegation must, however, be within the limits prescribed by the canons and according to the express authorization of the one superior legislative authority. It is likewise decreed that the de deacons who have sacrificed to pagan idols and afterwards resumed the conflict shall enjoy their other, their other honors, but shall abstain from any, every sacred ministry, neither bringing forth the bread and the cup nor making proclamations. Nevertheless, any, if any of the bishops shall observe in them distress of mind and meek humiliation, it, it shall be lawful for the bishops to grant more indulgence or to take away what has been granted. As evidenced by the phrase, it shall be lawful for the bishops to grant more indulgence or to take away what has been granted, economy might be a more lenient or a more strict observance of the rule. Consequently, economy is an, any deviation from the norm. The exercise of economy ceases if its cause no longer exists or if the basis for its application rested upon false or pretended grounds. Once economy has been applied, the normative practice is restored as before. Furthermore, temporary departure from the normative practice through economy does not set precedent. So it's the standard is uh, up here, but because of the needs of your soul, God will meet you where you are with the aim of you moving to be up here. And so it can't be granted twice or circumstances change. It may, you know, it makes sense. The institution of economy has been actively invoked throughout the history of the Orthodox Church. This is probably perhaps in due in part to liberal trends of thought in the cultural milieu within the which the Orthodox Church flourished. Although authority in the exercise of economy, especially in matters of great importance, rests with the synod of bishops and each of local church, this authority, as indicated, can be delegated to individual bishops as well. The ecumenical synod, as supreme administrative and legislative and judicial body in the church, administers ultimate authority in the exercise of economy. 
It alone can alter or overrule the decision of any subordinate ecclesiastical authority. In the realm of conscience, however, it is the spiritual father who has been entrusted with its authority to exercise economy according to his judgment. The determining factor in its application, however, must always be the spiritual welfare of the penitent. It's really slippery. And part of it is good. There's a good application of it. I'm not a bishop. But man, is this... Subject to possible abuse. Canonical discipline. Since the realm of consciousness, conscience has been mentioned, a final word remains regarding the character of canonical discipline. Following a penitent's admission of guilt in the sacrament of penance, the spiritual father determines whether acts of penance should be prescribed. These acts of penance may include fasting, prostration, prayer, acts of charity, or minor excommunication, temporary exclusion from Holy Communion, among others. Acts of penance must not be confused with punishment in the sense of retribution for evil committed. They must not have any element of vindictive punishment about them. On the contrary, the purpose of the Church's canonical discipline is both pastoral and pedagogical. It seeks both to correct and to perform the penit repentant sinner and to protect the community from the resulting sin. Consequently, by depriving the sinner of a holy communion for a time, it seeks to impress upon the individual the gravity of his sin. At the same time, if the sin is publicly known, it seeks to demonstrate that certain acts are, beyond any doubt, inadmissible for everyone. The Church, which is the mystical body of Christ, disposes of her own means to achieve the salvation of all her members. Although the Church is simultaneously a human and a divine institution, her earthly aspect is predominantly spiritual. So long as the Church retains this aspect of her existence, the holy canons together with the canonical, canonical tradition emanating from them will be an essential part of her earthly life. In conclusion, it is the Church's canons and the canonical tradition which assure the external means of security within which the life of the Spirit is nurtured and preserved. <clears throat> body metaphors. The Church is the body of Christ. The body has many members, but one head. The head conditions the expression, the movement of each of the members toward unity with that head, communion. And in different times and places, the organism of the church has differing circumstances to deal with that require canons that are consistent with one another throughout time, but applied differently in different use cases. As a physician provides different remedies for sicknesses of soul and body. So the rules, the rules form the, the knowledge of the shape of the body and what the body needs to stay in shape. Which means that if there were to be a derelict hierarch who was applying economy in so much, such a way as to not enable the spiritual flourishing of the people under his care, but rather misapplying or choosing not to apply certain canonical restrictions could be seen as enabling people to not move in the direction of holiness at all.
Ah, não. Está a ganhar.